Welcome back to Dirty Medicine's Dirty Ethics series. In today's video, we're going to be talking about the much maligned topic of capacity. The reason that medical students don't like learning about capacity and understanding the elements of capacity is that the questions that get written on exams about capacity are actually pretty challenging. The first step in allowing a patient to make any decision at all when it's an ethics question that you're getting on your exam is to first determine capacity. So oftentimes, you'll get these questions that seem so silly, right? It's a patient that is clearly doing something stupid. They're making a decision that will definitely harm themselves. The classic example is just for refusing to undergo dialysis if they have kidney disease, or refusing to take their antibiotics if they have sepsis, things like that. Those are the types of questions that you should be on the lookout for. And as a general rule of thumb, anytime the question says, which of the following is the best immediate thing to say, it always has something to do with capacity. So most of these questions will describe somebody who doesn't really make a great decision, and it'll ask you as the physician, what's the first thing that you should say? And the answer is usually along the lines of, I understand that this is a difficult decision for you. Can you tell me how you arrived at that decision? That statement, can you tell me how you arrived at that decision, is another way of assessing a patient's capacity. So the first step in any question that you get on USMLE or Comlex, when it's like, what do you say first? The first step is to try to assess their capacity. So in order to assess their capacity, you have to know the four components of capacity. Because after all, how do you know what the first thing to say is if, if you don't know what you're supposed to say, right? How do you know how to assess capacity and therefore what the first thing you're supposed to say is if you don't know what the four components of capacity actually is. So that's the goal of this video. We're going to start by talking about an overview of capacity and compare it to another term called competency. We're then going to transition into the four different components of capacity and I'll explain how you figure out if a patient has capacity or not. So let's begin this video with a discussion of two terms that are often mixed up. Now I was guilty of this as well. In medical school I didn't understand the difference. So let me just point out that capacity is a medical term and competency is a legal term. So capacity is somebody's uh, is a patient's ability to make a specific medical decision. But somebody's competency is their legal right to have global decision making. So if somebody is stripped of competency, that's assessed by a judge. But if somebody is deemed not to have medical capacity to make a certain medical decision for themselves, that's assessed by a physician. So, you know, you've probably seen shows like Law and Order before where somebody is described as incompetent to stand trial. That should remind you that competency or incompetent, you know, not having competency is something that is done legally, assessed by a judge. It strips you of your global decision-making ability. So a court can mandate that you're not allowed to make decisions for yourself and in turn, they'll appoint a decision-maker for you. Capacity, on the other hand, is a strictly medical term. Again, this is your ability to make a specific medical decision. It's assessed by a physician, oftentimes a psychiatrist, but it can be any physician. And the thing is, is that capacity can change with the decision at hand or from moment to moment. Competency, on the other hand, usually does not change, right? It's much more of a global legal issue. So as you can see here, the differences between capacity and competency, which are really important and high yield to understand, I've shown in red for capacity and blue for competency. So to quickly summarize, Capacity is medical, competency is legal. Capacity is a specific decision. Competency tends to be more global decision-making. Capacity is assessed by a physician. Competency is assessed by a judge. Capacity can certainly change depending on the decision at hand or the clinical state of the patient, whereas competency usually doesn't change. It tends to be ruled on by a court and then will stay that way you know, until there's a further hearing. So those are the differences between capacity and competency. I think that the way to understand the four components of capacity is to set an example, use an actual an example like you might see on a test, and then walk through what the four components are. And then we'll come back at the end and talk about some high yield information that you should keep in mind, the stuff that tends to get nitpicked a lot in these questions. So let's set an example here. There's a 55 year old white male who has a past medical history of schizophrenia. He presents to the ED complaining of fatigue, subjective fever, cachexia, and productive cough. He's found to have a consolidating lung mass and he's diagnosed with pneumonia. He gets admitted to the medical ICU where he decompensates, goes into septic shock and codes. CPR is performed per ACLS protocol and he achieves a return of spontaneous circulation. A few hours later, 
He's demanding to leave the hospital against medical advice. So in this situation, the patient clearly has their capacity called into question because this really serious event has taken place and now they want to leave the hospital. So let's talk about the four criteria of capacity. Each of these four criteria absolutely have to be met in order for a patient to have capacity. So in this example, the question is, the question at hand is, does the patient have capacity to leave the hospital against medical advice. Remember, capacity has to be about a specific medical decision. The question is not, does this patient have capacity, period. The question is specific, does the patient have capacity to leave the hospital against medical advice? In other words, is the patient's sound of mind enough to make the decision that he can leave the hospital despite this really serious septic shock that just made him code? So we're answering a specific, specific question. We're not globally asking if they have competency to make every decision. We're saying, do they have the capacity medically to make this one specific decision? So let's talk about the first criteria. So the first criteria in order to assess a patient's capacity is that the patient is informed about the decision at hand. So they're given all of the information about their medical condition. They're explained everything. In the hospital, the way that this works is whoever's taking care of the patient explains to them everything that's going on. So the example would be if a physician turns to the patient and says something like this, you were diagnosed with pneumonia and ultimately coded because of the infection of your, in your bloodstream. We did chest compressions and gave you epinephrine, which was a medication that helped revive your heart to save your life. You have a very dangerous infection and you're at risk for dying if you leave this hospital. So that's something that the physician would say to the patient. What they're doing is they're telling the patient what's going on, they're telling the patient what happened, and they're telling the patient the prognosis if they leave the hospital. So the patient is being informed about everything that's associated with their ability to make the specific decision if they wanna leave the hospital against medical advice. So that's the first criteria. If the patient was never given the information about what's going on, then of course they don't have capacity because they don't even have the information at hand. So criteria number one, patient is informed. That's criteria number one. Criteria number two for capacity, the patient communicates a clear decision. So this one's kind of obvious and it's the simplest of the four criteria. In order for a patient to have capacity to make a specific medical decision, they have to actually communicate to you and articulate what their decision is. So in this case, the patient might say something like, get me the hell out of this hospital right now. So right there, they're telling you what they want. The question is, do they have the capacity to leave the hospital against medical advice? And after being informed and satisfying criteria number one, the patient has taken all of that information in and said to you, I want to leave. Get me the hell out of here. So they are clearly communicating their decision with regards to the greater question of, do they have capacity to make a specific decision to leave the hospital against medical advice? After all, if the patient never makes a decision, then of course they don't have capacity. If you're asking them to make a medical decision and they don't give you an answer, then they don't have capacity because they're not giving you their decision. So this one's kind of obvious. Let's talk about criteria number three. The patient appreciates the nature and severity of their illness, okay? The patient appreciates the nature and severity of their illness. So the best way to assess this part is to point blank ask the patient something like, so tell me what might happen if you leave the hospital right now. And this might seem obvious to you because you've already given them criteria number one. You've already told them what the prognosis is. Now you need to ask them through sort of the teach back method if they understand the severity of their illness. In this example, we have a patient with septic shock coming from pneumonia. And if you ask them what might happen if you leave the hospital right now and they can't tell you that it's possible that I die, it's possible that I get a really bad infection. It's possible that my heart stops. If they can't appreciate all of that severity associated with their illness, then they lack capacity. So criteria number three is that the patient appreciates the nature and severity of their illness. Very, very important. The fourth and final criteria of capacity is that the patient can explain their decision-making to you in a relatively logical and linear fashion. Now, this one is very subtle and very tricky, so I'm gonna do a little bit of explaining after I give you the example. But let's say that the patient says to you, or let's say that you, have, you as the physician ask the patient, so why do you wanna leave the hospital then? Tell me how you came to that decision if you understand you know, the severity of your illness. If they say something like, my father was admitted to a MICU once, you know, he had a breathing tube put in, they poked him with needles every day, they drew his blood, he had lines coming out of every extremity, I just don't wanna live like that. That is an example of having capacity. That's absolutely logical decision-making. Now, let me just point something out here. 
it can be a really shitty decision. You don't have to agree with it as the physician. In this case, it's a terrible decision. Who, who cares about lines and breathing tubes if it's going to save your life ultimately? So even if you disagree with their decision making, if their decision making is logical and linear and they can explain to you how they processed all of the information through the first three criteria and arrived at this decision, then they very much have capacity and you have to respect their decision. So how do you remember this stuff? The four criteria of capacity, extremely high yield, extremely important for all ethical questions. How do you remember? So let's highlight some letters here. First criteria is in, patient is informed. I for informed. Second criteria, patient communicates their decision. So they're communicating to you. C for communicates. Third criteria, the patient appreciates the nature and severity of their illness. So they have to appreciate what's going on. Fourth and final criteria, the patient can explain their decision logically. So they're logical, L for logical. So the really stupid dirty medicine mnemonic here, and you know, it's stupid in the sense that it's so simple, but it's, I think it's brilliant because it helped me remember the criteria of capacity, is that if you look at these letters, informed, communicates, appreciates, logical, I-C-A-L, it's I-Cal. And I always think about the app on my phone, I-Cal, and I think about the capacity of my I-Cal app, right? How much information, how much date planning stuff can this app actually hold because I load my schedules into it nonstop. So I think about the capacity of the iCal app to help me remember I for informed, C for communicates, A for appreciates, and L for logical. Those are the four criteria of capacity. So that's how you remember it. Those are the four criteria. Let's just wrap up by talking about some high yield stuff. I, this might be a little repetitive because I'm sure that I've mentioned some of this already, but I really want to drive home these high yield features because if you get a question about capacity, it can be really, really tricky and I want you to get the free point. So last slide here, high yield information. Capacity can change decision to decision or moment to moment. So remember that it's the capacity to make a specific medical decision. So one minute you can be assessing the patient's uh, ability to leave the hospital against medical advice. And then let's say they decide to stay and then they refuse to take their antibiotic. You can assess the patient's capacity to you know, refuse an antibiotic. Whatever it is, it changes decision to decision. The other thing is that it changes moment to moment. So you know, patients can be delirious. They can be septic. They can have a lot of clinical things going on that will cloud their mental and cognitive status. So if you assess a patient, let's say, in one moment and you find that they don't have capacity, you could very well assess them 30 minutes later for the same exact decision and find that they do have capacity. And just because you fail capacity once does not mean you can't have it at another time. So this can really change moment to moment. Very, very high yield to keep that in mind. Next point, psychiatric diagnoses do not preclude a patient from having capacity. So if you're depressed, have schizophrenia, have bipolar, have schizoaffective disorder, all of that really psychotic stuff does not prevent you from having capacity. In this case, the patient had schizophrenia and still had capacity in our example. So, you know, you absolutely need to remember that just because somebody has a diagnosis that on paper sounds like their cognition will be altered doesn't mean that they can't have capacity. Point three, which we already talked about, even if it's a stupid reason, they have capacity if it's logical. So even if they're making a really terrible decision and they're probably putting themselves in danger, they can still have capacity. So you don't have to necessarily agree with what they're deciding, but they have the, the right to decide it. Point four, um, even, or so point four, if their reason for making a decision is to commit suicide, they cannot make that decision. So if somebody tells you that they want to leave the hospital against medical advice and you ask them why, and they tell you that they just want to go home and die, they, they can't make that decision, right? Because at that point, you're going to have to involuntarily commit them to inpatient psychiatry. So if the reason for their decision is that they're trying to die or trying to kill themselves, then that cannot, you know, that does not satisfy capacity. That, that actually would trigger somebody probably being admitted to psychiatry. Last point, changing their mind is usually a red flag that they don't have capacity. So if you're assessing a patient's ability to make a certain decision and they make a decision, they're like, yeah, never mind, never mind. I'm changing my mind. Oh, actually, you know what? Let's do it. Yeah, uh, you know what? I know I'm going back and forth, forget it. No, 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 I don't want to do it. So changing their mind like that, huge red flag that they don't have capacity. So changing your mind should tip you off that no capacity. So that's it, guys. That's capacity in a nutshell. We talked about capacity versus competency. We talked about the four criteria of capacity, and then we talked about some high yield information. If you get a question on test day and it's about capacity, I think that you're really, really well suited to dominate that question and get the free point.